one's spiritual needs. There are seven for the body, called the corporal works of mercy, after the Latin word corpus, which means body, and there are seven for the soul, rightly called the spiritual works of mercy. It's precisely because the human person is a body-soul composite that the 14 works of mercy are so important in the life of the Christian who is ready to aid his neighbor. As human persons, we not only have bodies, we are bodies. And we not only have souls, we are souls. And both the corporal and spiritual aspects of the human person need to be nurtured and maintained. Rooted in sacred scripture, the corporal works of mercy are the following to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, visit the imprisoned, shelter the homeless, visit the sick, and bury the dead. The spiritual works of mercy are to admonish the sinner, instruct the ignorant, counsel the doubtful, comfort the sorrowful, bear wrongs patiently, forgive all injuries, and to pray for the living and the dead. Pope St. Gregory the Great says that when we attend to the needs of those in want, we give them what is theirs, not ours. More than performing works of mercy, we are paying a debt of justice. I'm Father Wade Menezes of the Fathers of Mercy for EWTN. Thanks for tuning in to the wonders of His mercy. EWTN, live truth, live Catholic. Welcome to EWTN's coverage of the 10th World Meeting of Families. We're coming to you straight, as you can see, from St. Peter's Square. I'm Catherine Hadro, and I'm joined today by my two co-hosts, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, Executive Editor and Washington, D.C. Bureau Chief of EWTN News, and Father Thomas Petrie, the President of the Dominican House of Studies. We have a great week ahead. We do. It is said and has been taught for generations and thousands of years that uh, the family is the building block of society. Yes. This World Meeting of Families brings families from all over the world uh, to recognize that fact, but then to build on that, to send people back to where they live so that they can proclaim it, defend it, and teach it. It's a great commission. It's the focus of the church this week, and it's the focus of our programming this week as well. Father, you've been on EWTN many times. Our viewers are familiar with you, but for those those who aren't familiar with the Dominican House of Studies, can you tell us what it is? Well, Catherine, the Dominican House of Studies is in Washington, D.C. It's where we train young men to be Dominican priests. And uh, not just young men to be Dominican priests, but also religious women and religious men and lay men and lay women to teach them uh, the wonderful things about St. Thomas Aquinas. I'm thrilled to be here in Rome with you, too. It's just great to be back in the Eternal City. <laughs> I know, absolutely. You can feel it's palpable, the excitement here. You, we've been seeing, you know, the past few days, families descending on to Rome. A lot more people will be coming tonight even. And the official kickoff event is tomorrow with the Festival of Families. But we wanted to give you a preview show today because this is such a focus of the church this week. Well, that's right. And there are a lot of events that we're going to be carrying, yes. covering in yes. detail. We're going to yes. have a lot of guests here talking about what's happening. Yes. All of it focused very much on Pope Francis, who's going to, scheduled at least, uh, to take part in three different events. Mm -hmm. We've got the Festival of Families, we've got his Mass on, on Saturday, and we also have his Angelus, uh, where he's going to give this mandate to families. But then there are also the, the catechesis, uh, the, the teachings that people are going to be receiving. We've got panels, we have the testimonials of families from all over the world. So there's an immense amount of things just happening here over the next few days and we're going to be there every step of the way. Absolutely. It's going to be a packed schedule and it's our job. We'll be listening in to all of those speakers. We'll be bringing that back to you. You'll be getting it as well. What are you both most looking forward to the most? Well, I I'm looking forward to just hearing from the lay people. You know, the yeah. World Meeting of Families was started by St. John Paul II, yeah. who I'm a big fan of. I think all of us are. I have written a book about him on his thought. 
um, consider him very much a patron saint, a personal patron saint. And the World Meeting of Families was his inspiration. And it's going to be wonderful to see how it has developed over the last uh, 10 World Meeting of Families. This is the 10th meeting. And this one is a very unique one, isn't it, Matthew? Well, it is for a couple of different reasons. Uh, the, the first most obvious one is that this is the first that we have now emerged out of the shadow, we certainly hope and seem to, of COVID. Uh, this was supposed to have been held last year uh, as a commemoration or a celebration, as far as Pope Francis is concerned, of the anniversary of his promulgation of Amoris Laetitia. So we've had this year of Amoris leading up to this. Then we also have just the unique nature of world meetings of families, where this is the first opportunity that a lot of families have had to travel internationally. Where Pope Francis, we've seen the crowds gathering more and more here for the his Angelus, mm -hmm. uh, his weekly audiences, and other events. But this is one where families are deliberately coming to Rome as families. It's a pilgrimage, you it know? Is. And, and typically the World Meeting of Families is the largest gathering of Catholic families. It's not going to look that way this week. You know, it's limited to 2,000 families right. only. So it will be, you know, striking typically the mass for the World Meeting of Families millions even have attended. It won't be to that scale. It won't. Uh, and to your point, too, there's something important to note right from the very outset of this, that this has the stamp. Pope John Paul II left his. Benedict mm -hmm. XVI left his. So mm -hmm. it's what popes do. But Pope Francis has very much left his mark on the preparations and what's going to be happening here over the next few days. We're seeing, for example, a real focus in the presentations, in the testimonials, in the catechesis of lay people speaking. Yes. But then there's also, uh, in those catechesis, uh, teachings that are classically Francis, mm -hmm. where he talks about, for example, the three things you need for a, a help, healthy and successful marriage. Of, I'm sorry, please, thank you. Classic Pope uh, Classic Francis. Pope Francis. Yes. So a lot of uh, Francis is here, but then we're still looking at the profound legacy of St. John Paul II. That's a really good point. And if you do look at the program schedule, which viewers can see at RomeFamily2022.com, the complete schedule, you'll see it is mostly married couples who are speaking. And there is a great focus this week on marriage married saints. The entire theme for the week is family love, a vocation, and a path to holiness. But of course, we will be joined by bishops as well, and there will be priests as well, because their vocation and their role is important as well. Um, and I know, Father, that you mentioned that you have a love for St. John Paul II. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that? I know we'll go into him more extensively, but you've met him. You studied him extensively. Well, you know, when, li listening to you speak about the role that families are going to have at this World Meeting of Families, that the couples are going to be giving these talks. This is John Paul, you know, through and through. Yeah. There was a day, and there still is, obviously priests and clerics play a big role in marriages and p helping people to prepare for marriage. I helped you prepare for marriage and, you know, did your wedding. Uh, but also... Uh, lay people should be helping other lay people. You know, and we had that great couple, the Grabowskis, you know, helping you and Matt to prepare for a marriage. And so I think to give the faithful and married couples their proper place of speaking from their experience yeah. and that uh, of marriage and growing in holiness together. And on that personal note, Father Thomas Petrie, you played a huge role in my marriage as well. You walked alongside my husband, Matt, and I in our marriage prep. You celebrated our wedding, our matrimony. And so I think it'll be so interesting to hear your insight throughout this week. You know, we'll be hearing from married couples, but to hear your insight as well. It will, in the panels, they go a across a broad spectrum. We're going to be do. hearing about marriage prep. We're going to be hearing even about the reality of domestic violence mm -hmm. in Catholic families mm -hmm. as well. And also the generations, which yes. is another one of those uh, Francis themes. He has been talking about, really from the start of his pontificate, the importance of having those bridges between the generations. Mm -hmm that the young have so much to learn from the old. And, but it's a journey that as a family you have to make together. And then that ties into the whole th question that he raises again and again of the throwaway culture of what is valued, who is important. Yes. Well, as I mentioned, we have a very packed week ahead and we have a special report for you to preview the world's meeting of families. After almost two years of suspended events due to the coronavirus pandemic, the 10th World Meeting of Families will finally take place in Rome this summer. Four years after the last World Meeting of Families in Dublin, families, theologians, and believers from all over the world will again come to the Eternal City from June the 22nd to the 26th. International representatives of Family Pastoral Ministry will participate in the Pastoral Congress and the Family Festival. 
the Holy Father is calling on all local dioceses to create parallel places of encounter and to carry out initiatives that implement the motto of the World Meeting of Families. It will be a meeting where it is possible where you can get to know each other, meet the Holy Father, listen to his word and confront to each other. We are in the synodal journey, so we are in that phase of listening to each other. The first World Meeting of Families was held in Rome on October the 8th and 9th in 1994 at the suggestion of Pope John Paul II. Since then, this event has been organized to take place every three years and in different places of the world. It's typically introduced by an international theological pastoral congress. The challenges facing families today are many. In many countries, there are efforts to soften and relativize the traditional concept of family. At the same time, the state is in many cases trying to take over the very task of raising children, which has always been the responsibility of parents. I believe that the Christian family, the family that shines of the love that is celebrated in marriage, is a witness that overcomes even all the critical issues and difficulties. So the church proposes this message, that it shines because of its beauty, and it is a message that is always valid because it fascinates all generations, because it is beautiful to love each other for a lifetime and promise love and fidelity forever. So helpful to hear that report from Alan Holdren about what to expect from the week ahead. Again, the official event kicks off tomorrow with the Festival of Families, but there is so much to speak about. And Matthew, as you mentioned, Pope Francis will participate in three events, the Festival of Families tomorrow, the Mass in St. Peter's Square on Saturday, and the Angelus on Sunday. But it is yet to be seen if he will be celebrating that Mass. Yeah, and that's it's a fair question simply because he, he was not able to celebrate the, the Mass of Corpus Christi, for right. example. Uh, he has had a delegate or representative filling in for him yes. uh, at various events. Uh, we have had the, the, the sight of him, uh, which was jarring for a lot of us who followed him really mm -hmm. since the start of his pontificate, and appearing in a wheelchair. Right. So there is the question that has been raised about his health. Uh, and will he be able to take part in these events? Right. I think it's very likely that he'll be here at the very least for the Festival of Families yes. uh, and for the Angelus. And he will likely be in attendance for the Mass in, in some fashion or another. Yes. But there has been this week, uh, we really need to talk about a little bit, wild speculation about some sort of an impending resignation, that sort of thing. Right. Uh, and, and the Holy See, uh, I think Pope Francis himself uh, would look at this and, and wonder where some of this rumor mongering coming is coming from, from. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, we'll see over the next few days but uh, Francis seems very determined to continue on with his schedule yeah. and the very busy schedule as Pope. Absolutely he uh, has an inflamed ligament in his knee so that's been limiting his ability to walk and got a lot of attention when he postpones his recent trip to Congo that's right. but he is still planning to travel to Canada that's right. next that's month. Right. So, so we'll see sort of a day by day as to uh, what he's able to do and what right. he's able to participate in and what travels he's able to make. Yes. But I think he's very focused on this this event this week. It's important. It's relatively a new phenomenon to see a pope in a wheelchair. Now, we did see at the end of John Paul's pontificate that he would often appear with needing assistance, and we watched St. John Paul II suffer publicly. That is a really a modern phenomenon, you know. Previous popes, especially in the 20th century, it was not common to see the pope suffering from mm -hmm. old age. Uh, you know, I have friends who were priests in Rome during Paul VI's pontificate, mm -hmm. and one tells me they can celebrate a mass and they could tell towards the end of his pontificate as he was incensing the altar, mm -hmm. the two deacons were actually carrying him. His feet were not touching the ground. That you know, they, he was kind wow. of floating around the altar. Yeah. So, but Pope Francis, as you mentioned earlier, Matthew is interested in making sure we understand that the elderly still make a contribution. And he often refers to himself as elderly now. He does. He's been doing a series of catecheses uh, focusing on aging, on the elderly. And he had a great phrase a couple of weeks ago that as you get older, things, certain things are taken from you. Hmm. And he said, I have to get used, he said, to using a cane to get around. And that, that's one of the things he's been doing when he's been a little more mobile. But one of the things that you hit on, Father, I think is it worth also noting that historically we didn't have 24-7 coverage, we didn't have social media, we didn't have everyone taking a That's photograph a and blasting it all over the world. Popes came, they died, they left huge impressions on the history of the church and the history of humanity. 
but they were, for the most part, sort of distant figures for the average Catholic. Now, in part thanks, honestly, in my view, to Pope St. John Paul II, popes have this remarkable place on the world stage, and, and that's where Francis is. It's really remarkable, and Pope Francis has been using that in, in, in much the same way St. John Paul II did, you know, mm -hmm. um, becoming a teacher who's constantly in the mode of teaching. I mean, that's, you know, he is a member of the Society of Jesus, and the, and the Jesuits are teachers. And I love that we'll be talking about the multiple generations, because that's the reality of the family as well. And I think when it comes to one crisis or challenge facing families today as those generations are split apart. You know, historically you would have grandparents so involved with the lives of their grandchildren and their children, but now young people are moving away from their family. And so what are some other issues and um, that you think are facing the family today that should be addressed this week? One aspect of that generational yeah. yes. point that you just raised uh, is that of fatherlessness of families Absolutely. where children are raised without a father. Yes. We also have situations all too common, not just in the United States, but around the world, of children who are raised not by their parents, but by their grandparents. Yeah. Uh, so the importance, again, of that generational connection. Yeah. Uh, and the role of parents and grandparents in raising children in the faith in the face of so many challenges today. So I think that's one of the aspects that we're going to hear a lot this week, secularization, the challenges of culture. Relativism. I mean, we're seeing so much of attempts to redefine what the family is this month in particular. What are some issues that you'll be looking out well, for? Well, I would echo, echo Matthew's point that when I travel and when I yeah. talk to married couples and families of all generations, um, the primary thing they're often concerned about is their children's lack of fidelity to the church, their lack of practice. And and the church, you know, especially in the United States, is doing better on that in that regard and helping to educate and helping parents to educate their children in the faith. But there's still far too many baptized Catholics who will self-identify by the time they're in high school and then certainly in college as atheist or as relativistic, as secularist, um, who just stop going to mass and stop stop praying, stop talking to God. And that's a real that's a real problem. The rise of the nuns. Well, N-O-N-E-S, <laughs> to clarify. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then we can add into that as well the, the, the effort on the part of many in secular culture and relativism. We see it every day. We've got cases sitting in front of the Supreme Court that we're yeah. waiting to hear yeah. what the opinions are on a secular culture that is no longer tolerant of religion, yeah. uh, in particular the Catholic faith, the Christian faith. Yeah. And that's one other aspect, too, that so this, this moving in of culture into the life of the families, of supplanting the role of parents in raising of children, yeah. uh, and what is the correct role of the state in the pursuit of the common good. These are big questions, and I think we're going to have a chance to talk a little bit about those this week. I think so. I think we'll be hearing a lot about that. You're right. It's you know less of a tolerance for Catholicism. It's also hostility towards Catholicism. That's really fair. I'm even thinking right now in the United States, we're awaiting the Dobbs Supreme Court case, and we're seeing right now attacks on pro-life pregnancy care centers. This is a real problem uh, facing the U.S. in particular, and I think it will be so helpful to hear representatives from across the globe, what are the challenges facing families right now? And it's important, that's part of, of being a global Catholic church, is us hearing each other and coming together. There's a fundamental problem with uh, much of the culture accepting the fact that there is such a thing as reality. You know, um, Matthew, just, I think you're right, that so in the United States right now, um, freedom of self-expression is seen as more important as freedom of religion. Freedom of self-expression because in the United States, self-expression is my truth, yeah. and you have to respect my truth. Needless to say, we have a lot to cover these days ahead, and with that, we'll continue our coverage right after this break. O guardian angel, whom God in his infinite mercy has appointed over me, enlighten, protect, direct, and govern me this day. Amen. Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I adore you profoundly. 
I offer you the most precious body, blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in all the tabernacles of the world, in reparation for the outrages, sacrileges and indifferences by which he is offended, by the infinite merits of his most sacred heart and through the immaculate heart of Mary, I beg the conversion of poor sinners. Amen. We're all familiar with the gospel where Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet while her sister Martha does the cooking and cleaning. And when Martha complains about the obvious, Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and worried about many things. There's need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better portion. That gospel always bothered me. If Martha weren't cooking and cleaning, no one would have eaten. <laughs> but if you think about it, Jesus didn't say, Martha, Martha, stop cooking. He said, stop being anxious about many things. Look, it's okay to work hard, but Jesus is telling us, don't be scattered and busy, be occupied. If there's a hundred things on your plate, make sure there's only one thing on your heart. There's need of only one thing. And what's that one thing? Love. Receive every task as a gift from God and offer it back to Him and do it all with love and generosity and imitation of Jesus. I know, easier said than done. Lord, help me to be like Mary when I have to work like Martha. Welcome back to EWTN's coverage of the 10th World's Meeting of Families here in Rome, Italy. And we are now joined by Bishop Donald Tying from the Diocese of Madison, Wisconsin. Thank you for joining us. It's an honor to be with you on such a beautiful night here in Rome. Isn't it beautiful? So first off, right off the bat, what are you most looking forward to this week for the World's Meeting of Families? I think it's already occurred. It's just being with uh, families, with the laity uh, from throughout the United States as we pray together, as we share faith together, as we talk about just marriage and family ministry uh, throughout our country, and then to be joined by people from the global church to l really look at marriage and family and how do we uh, strengthen marriage and family, which clearly is uh, a great need uh, throughout the world and throughout the church. We see clearly marriage is a sacrament and the mm -hmm. family is the domestic church, and it's there that the building block of the church really flourishes. Absolutely. Well, Your Excellency, uh, here we are in Rome for the World Meeting of Families. It's the 10th gathering of the World Meeting. Uh, for you, what's the importance of the World Meeting, I mean, mm. at, as an institution in the life of the Church? Mm. Um, St. John Paul II instituted World Meeting of Families because he clearly viewed uh, the family as the way by which God entered the world in Jesus Christ, and it's in the family that uh, children first learn to know God, to love God, to serve God. So World Meeting of Family really puts um, marriage and family life um, front and center in the life of the church. Mm -hmm. And just kind of like World Youth Day, it's a moment to celebrate, to catechize, to pray, and to really strengthen um, married couples and families throughout the world to say their vocation is a noble one, an absolute essential one in terms of what consecration of marriage means. Absolutely. You know, so often, Excellency, when we talk about vocations, we're always praying for vocations to the priesthood, vocations mm -hmm. to religious life. Now, of course, marriage is a natural, natural impetus. It's a natural thing. Right. But what can clerics do? What can priests do to better support the vocation to holiness that marriage can be? I think we need to uh, preach about it more, hmm. teach about it more, do more um, proximate formation of our young people so the more clearly they understand the beauty of their sexuality uh, the beauty of the complementarity of the sexes, the, the essential and sacramental nature of marriage, they're going to be well-equipped, confident, and eager to enter into this uh, sacred matrimonial covenant. That's beautiful, the, the importance of accompanying married couples, and whether that's even in marriage prep mm -hmm. and, and what have you. So you are part of the U.S. delegation here at the World Meeting of Families. Yeah. What are your priorities? What are you hoping is discussed here this week? Clearly, uh, the U.S. bishops uh, recently put out a, a whole new guideline for marriage preparation. So internally to our delegation, we're going to be discussing that, reflecting on it, and pondering what are practical ways that we can implement this. So church is great at creating documents. It's a whole other challenge <laughs> right. to take that document, implement it, make it real on the local level. Just like politics, all church is local. So we need to localize that in dioceses and in parishes. But I think on the global level with the Holy Father, with 
other bishops, with laity throughout the world. It's really a moment for us to look at in, in this critical hour to really lift up marriage and family as essential, not only to the future and present of the church, but really to the future of the human race, as we know. I mean, it was instituted by God, and um, that marital covenant is the one gift not washed away in the flood, you know, when you look at Genesis. That's beautiful. You just used the phrase, this critical time. Mm -hmm. uh, there are obviously so many challenges for families, not just in the United States, but across the world. Mm -hmm. What do you see are, are some of the key challenges that you hope are discussed here and that mm -hmm. solutions are offered that, that all married couples that everyone can take with them back to their yeah. parishes and dioceses? I think from, from my vantage point in the United States, uh, a large factor is the fear of commitment. Mm -hmm. you know, we just yes. see in young people in general, they have so many options. There's this myriad number of doors that they can walk through. And, and to choose one means closing all the others. So it's kind of like, let's keep my options open. I don't want to commit to anything um, permanently. So when a couple get married in Christ sacramentally, that is such a radical thing. Because they're saying, you know, I'm going to be faithful to you no matter what. So for me, I think it's emphasizing the permanence of marriage, but in a way that doesn't frighten people it invites them to step into this mystery that is going to fulfill them and transform them. That's so well said. I know I've personally witnessed and seen my friends witness the crisis of commitment, as you mm -hmm. so put it. And I feel like I could hear St. John Paul II just say, be not afraid. Mm -hmm. You know, there is such a fear when it comes to the sacrament as yeah, well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm thinking I was ordained a priest in 1989. My first assignment in um, a suburb of Milwaukee, we had 90 weddings a year. Wow. And now that same parish has maybe 10. You know, so the number of Catholic marriages, at least in the United States, has precipitously dropped. And you know, how do we reverse that trend? Right. How do we help young people to see that um, marriage is the way to go right. for them, right? I think one of the things, and we've been talking about, is Pope Francis's emphasis on, on, on the generations and mm -hmm. the elderly and how having grandparents and seeing the fidelity mm -hmm. of marriage in, in grandparents and even parents, but as we know, even that has been somewhat lost, you know, yeah. with, with divorce and the high rapid rate of divorce in, even among Catholics in the yeah. United States. I mean, how, how can we address that? And Because mm -hmm. that's, that's going to help the permanence issue with the young. That's right. It's the beauty of, I think, Latin culture, African culture, there's a great respect for their elders. And you'll see multiple generations living in the same household. So right. the grandchildren learn from their grandparents. For whatever reason, we've kind of compartmentalized family mm -hmm. in the United States. But there's a lot for us to learn there. And you're right, Pope Francis talks about that a lot. I think it's born of his own experience that his grandparents lived with his family. Mm -hmm. And he learned a lot from them. I mean, he mentions them often. Go ahead. The theme this week is family love, a vocation, and a path to holiness. And I read that you're the youngest of six sons. Is That's that right. correct? I just have to ask, how did your family life and your background shape you and your vocation? Yeah, a key point was just the prayer life of my parents. Mm. So both of my parents prayed together, prayed separately. My father worked in a factory. He'd come home at 3.30. Wow. He'd go in his room. He'd close the door. He'd take a 15-minute nap. And then he would pray in there for 30 minutes wow. and then come out to deal with whatever we'd been up to since he left. <laughs> but uh, maybe that's why he was praying. But he never talked about the fact that he was in there praying, but mm. we all knew it. Mm. And then we prayed the rosary every night after supper, whether we wanted to or not. And I have to admit, there are beautiful nights when I was seven. I didn't necessarily want to pray the rosary. But my parents really um, inculcated that in us. So mm. when prayer becomes a living part of a family dynamic, the children are naturally going to be formed. So I felt like the Lord was just a member of our family. You know, there are holy pictures Beautiful. on the walls. We prayed. Uh, church wasn't just this one-hour thing on Sunday. It was really a way of life. And that's part of building Catholic culture within the family so that children just kind of naturally imbue, breathe the sense of faith. Yeah, the uh, Beltrami Quattrochi, the the blesseds are the patrons of this world meeting of families. There's a lot of discussion about them. It is fascinating to me, too, that the founder of the world meeting of families is now a saint himself, St. John Paul mm -hmm. II. Can you talk a little bit about the role of the models of saints in the domestic church, in providing those role models for husbands and wives, but also for children, for grandparents? Yeah, yeah we think of uh, St. Therese's parents who were canonized favorite saints of mine are St. Isidore the farmer and his wife, Maria de la Cabeza, 
is often not mentioned, but she's in there, and they're honored as a couple. So we need to lift up more couples, and I think recent popes have done that, to say that it's not just priests or nuns that have exemplarily lived holiness. It's married couples as well in the push and pull of, of the world. And that's precisely the role of the lady, to go and to sanctify the world, to consecrate the world for Christ. And obviously, marriage and family is the primary avenue by which that occurs. Wasn't that one of the greatest gifts of St. John Paul II's pontificate is all the various people that he canonized? Mm -hmm. Right. I would say saints are to holiness what astronauts are to outer space. That's awesome. They explore the outer realms of possibility, and they show us what one person imbued with the Holy Spirit is capable of, no matter the culture, the context, the historical moment. And there will be an emphasis on married saints this week in particular, and I think that is inspiring to see that also holiness comes in bunches, right? Mm -hmm. And if one member of the family pursues holiness, it does bear fruit for the rest of the family yeah. as well. And you certainly see that in St. Teresa's family, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Or in families where multiple children became priests and nuns, you know, that came from obviously the impetus of the parents and their practice of the faith, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, for all of us then, uh, your your takeaway is going to be what you hope uh, when you go home. What what do you hope to say to your flock? Mm. I think to be renewed myself personally in passionate commitment to marriage and family. And when I go home to ask my staff, ask our parishes, ask our pastors, ask our married folks, you know, how can we more profoundly institutionalize uh, the gifts of this world meeting? and also just the, the beautiful theology and spirituality that the church offers on marriage and family. There's no other church that has a more profound, rich, deep, um, extant you know, theology of marriage and family. I mean, it, it's profound. Absolutely, and I just wanna thank you for your support of the family, and thank you for your time today and speaking with us here as we preview the World's Meeting of Families, Bishop Donald Hine, thank it's you. honor to be with you, God bless you. God thank bless you. you. And as we mentioned, the World Meeting of Families was founded by St. John Paul II. Now, take a listen to St. John Paul II's words himself on the family. Never hesitate to look to Mary, the mother of the Holy Family and the mother of all mankind in the order of grace as a sure guide amid life's challenges and trials. I commend your families to Mary's maternal protection and prayers. May she ponder in her heart the mystery of God's love as it was revealed in the life of her son. Guide parents, guide children to respond fully to the vocation which they have received as sons and daughters of God, redeemed by Christ and born again in the Holy Spirit. beautiful video produced by the Knights of Columbus. It's so powerful to hear St. John Paul II speaking in English, you know. Growing up, uh, I, we're part of the John Paul II generation, right. you and I especially, and I can still hear him as a kid yeah. saying these things, teaching these things, yeah. and, it, and it really stays with you, uh, these teachings. But he was also, we can see this in that little patch that we just had, what mm -hmm. a prophet he was Absolutely. about the human person about the sacraments, in particular the, the marriage, the sacrament of marriage and the threats that it faces. 
Absolutely. And I mean, both of you are experts in St. John Paul II in your own right. And so I think I'm so grateful to be speaking with you both as we look at his influence at the World's Meeting of Families. Well, you know, when he first, on his first address to the first World Meeting of Families in 1994, he himself mentioned how important families were to him when he was a young priest. Remember, for John Paul's Carol Boitiwa, his mother died when he was nine years old. His older brother died when he was 12. His father died when he was 21. So at 21 years, years old, this young man was alone in the world. Um, and when he became a priest, he was known to be very close to young people and to young families. He wrote that great book, Love and Responsibility, mm. which was, I don't want to use the word scandalous, but for a lot mm. of Poles at the time, they had never seen a bishop or a priest, um, I think he was a bishop actually when it got published, right on uh, sexuality mm -hmm. and marriage issues and what can break down in a marriage and it was really refreshing yeah. M families have always been part were always part of his life and i would say as a priest myself mm. um, and as someone who's charged with helping to form priests yes. priests are families are always a very important part of priest's life every yeah. family that a priest comes into contact but then sometimes we're blessed to get to know some families even better than mm -hmm. others and get to learn from them you have an inside look at a variety of families and their most interior life and struggles that might be hidden from the rest of the world, but you see the most joyous days and the most sorrowful days. It, it's really true. Um, I would never claim marriage is not my vocation. I think marriage is a very difficult vocation. I mean, for me, it looks like a very difficult vocation mm -hmm. because it's not my vocation. Mm. But I would say in all the years I've been ordained a priest, I've been able to accompany yep. families at all stages, uh, whether it's preparing for marriage, getting married, having that first child, or having struggling to have the child, or having the child later in life, right. seeing children go off to college, and then even on deathbeds. Mm. And so priests have the opportunity to really get um, a very full view of family life across multiple families in a compressed amount of time. Every family is different and no family is perfect, but I thought it was so insightful to hear from Bishop Hine, just the influence of prayer in his family life and how he said, you know, God felt real to him. God was a member of the family to him. I think that's an important element that is often present in the families that I know that clearly are pursuing holiness and marriage as a vocation. To say that God is real, that we talk to him as a family, that he's present, there's crucifixes, there's pictures, that all may seem incidental, but when a child grows up in that and learns and eventually comes to find out his friends don't have that kind of relationship with God, that becomes a marker of their formative years that brings them closer to the church, makes the church seem more than just a building, but as right. a, a reality. And what Bishop said, a culture that we're, we live in even amidst the world, uh, even amidst the secular culture. Yeah, yeah and for the, the family then, that the challenges that they face uh, are very real. Yes. Uh, we live in a, in a culture, a time now, and Bishop Hines sort of referenced that a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenges of belief, uh, the, the, the failure of parents, uh, not attacking parents in any way, right. but the failure of parents to, to really create that culture, that yeah. communion of persons within the family, and to prepare their children for the many challenges that they're going to have, not just in, in learning a skill or being educated, but actually in making God real in their lives. And I think that's what will be so helpful, I imagine, this week, as we hear from so many families, what I think will be very practical tips. How do they try to cultivate holiness in their home? How do they try to make their home a preview of heaven? You know, because again, the point of a vocation is to get to heaven. And the goal as parents is to get your children to heaven. So I think that will be so insightful just to hear practical tips. Maybe it's like what Bishop said, praying the rosary every day as a family. I imagine that'll be a reoccurring theme this week. Well, and one other one too, uh, that as a catechism teaches us so importantly, the fourth commandment, honor your father and mother, to love your parents, to yeah. have respect for your parents, and to do everything you can not to replace them with the state or with culture or with something else. Absolutely. They are irreplaceable. Looking through St. John Paul II's pontificate, how central was the family to his teachings? I mean, did this just come up again and again? Well, it, it certainly did. I mean, it started in the beginning. He had his own synod on the family, you know, in the early 80s, from which he wrote Familiaris Consortium. 
Think of the theology of the body. Right. You know, those weekly audiences that sort of spurred on what I would only describe now as a cottage industry <laughs> of, of books on marriage and the family based on the theology of the body. His letters to women, he wrote two letters to women mm -hmm. and how motherhood, I mean, he coined the phrase, the feminine genius and, right. and, and women's unique genius as mothers, even if they're not yet biological mothers or never will be biological mothers. So this was always part of who he was from the very first moments of his priesthood and I really have to believe I really think it has to do with the fact that he lost his own family so early in his in his adult life but we can add too that we cannot separate the theology of the body and John Paul II's magnificent corpus of teachings on the family without also looking at the role he played in things like World Youth Day mm. the founder of that yes. uh, the role he played in helping the church and the world to understand again Evangelium Vitae the gospel mm. of life Veritatis splendor, the splendor of truth, that there have to be deep roots in the family, and the right. church has to help that family have those roots. That is amazing. You know, he founded World Youth Day and the World Meeting of Families, these major global <laughs> events of the church where it is a chance for the world to come together and the church to come together. Yeah, and he was willing to also go everywhere. Yes. I mean, in the, in the, the ten uh, World Meetings of Families, this is, I think, the third in Rome, Okay. He, there are places, it's all over the world, in Manila, he wasn't able to go to that, but the, uh, the Philippines was one, Valencia in Spain, uh, we have the other ones uh, elsewhere, Philadelphia, Dublin, where right. different popes have gone. Right. So it's spreading that message in exactly the same way as World Youth Day, mm -hmm. uh, where popes are willing to go to these locations. This was important for Francis to have here mm -hmm. uh, for Amoris, but mm -hmm. also to go back to those roots and, again, a recognition of COVID. Absolutely. Our coverage of the 10th World Meeting of Families will continue right after this break. Welcome to Catholic Blitz. Father John, you're on the hot seat. Are you ready? Ready, willing, and able. We have a question for you. All right. Why can't women be ordained? You have one minute to answer. Go. Well, the quick answer is that Jesus didn't ordain any women. <laughs> Twelve apostles were all men, and that's why the church will not ordain women. But also, we have a longer answer from Pope John Paul the Great. In 1994, he wrote a wonderful document called Ordinatio Sacerdotalis that made it very clear the church has no authority to change, which is the substantial element of a sacrament. So just as in baptism, you have to use water, you can't use milk. Holy Eucharist, you must use wheat bread and grape wine. You can't use uh, rice cakes or uh, grape juice. Likewise, for holy orders, it must be a baptized male who acts in persona Christi. And this is from sacred scripture and sacred tradition. And that's why women can't be ordained priests. Good job. See you next time on Catholic Blitz. We all have a guardian angel who is our heavenly helper assigned by God to watch over us during our lives. From the moment of conception, we are given a guardian angel who looks out for us, guides us to do good works, and protects us from evil. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says, From its beginning until death, human life is surrounded by their watchful care and intercession. Beside each believer stands an angel as protector and shepherd, leading him to life. Already here on earth, the Christian life shares by faith in the blessed company of angels and men united in God. We can reach out to our guardian angels at any time through the guardian angel prayer. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here. Ever this day be at my side to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. Welcome back to EWTN's coverage of the 10th World Meeting of Families here in Rome. We continue our preview show before the World Meeting officially kicks off tomorrow with the Festival of Families. And we are now joined by Paul Johannes. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And Paul, you are with the delegation representing the Nordic countries here at the World Meeting of Families. You're also a member of our EWTN Norway family as well. And you have a radio station, St. Rita Radio. Yes, that's, uh, that's correct. Uh, I, I'm here, first of all, as a delegate from the Nordic countries. We are four families here, 
Uh, it's me and my wife and our two uh, children, age uh, two and four. Uh, my wife is pregnant, so we actually have three children with us. So oh, that beautiful. Is, is a blessing. Uh, and uh, we started a radio it's two, two and a half years ago now. Okay. And uh, actually last week we came in agreement with EWTN to start EWTN Norway. Uh, it's such a blessing. Well, we're so grateful for your work. Paint a picture, if you would, of uh, life for families, and li especially Catholic families now in Norway, but also across Scandinavia. First of all, it's, it's quite lonely mm. because we are so few Catholics, uh, especially uh, Norwegian-speaking Catholic. We have a great Polish uh, group of Catholics. They are about 50% of the Catholics in our country. Uh, so for us, as being me as being a Norwegian and a convert, it's, it's actually quite lonely to start with. Mm. That is also one of the reasons why we started the radio, because uh, we found out it was a great way to find Catholic friends. <laughs> So it, it's um, in many ways changed our life. Uh, now we have a, a new bishop, Bishop Eric. He is a great friend of the families. So he started last year an initiative where we have a family meeting once a month with families in our uh, parish meeting together, staying one night and getting to know each other. If being such a minority in Norway, um, how you're raising your children, you want them to grow in holiness, grow closer to the church. Um, how are you and your wife accomplishing that mm -hmm. in such a culture where Catholicism is, is really uh, a minority religion? I, th I think it's difficult anywhere these times, uh, but, but we, we try to pray together. Uh, that's the main thing. We, we pray morning prayer together and evening prayer. And we try to make them proud of being Catholic. Uh, we try to show them to do the, the sign of the cross in public and uh, to, to don't be afraid. And also we do catechism. I, I think that is the key to keep them Catholic, uh, in a sense. Excellent. As part of the delegation, what is the main message you're hoping to share with other Catholic families gathering here across the globe? First of all, I think it's a strong signal that we have this in the month of June, mm. uh, a month where it might sometimes be difficult to be a Catholic family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to get that support from the Vatican that we can join all the families together in the month of June as a family celebration, uh, a celebration of the Catholic family, mm -hmm. I think that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, so that, is, that is the first thing. Second of all, I, th I think it's important to get to know other families. One of the, the delegates from Sweden, they have 10 kids. It's mm -hmm. amazing, and they are all here. So we can, we can meet other Catholics and see that we are not alone and that, that we are a big society. Right. We just need to find each other. It's a battery charger type of event, isn't it? It's, it's important to come together and build each other up and, you know, remind ourselves that we are going to be counter-cultural. We should be as Catholics. Yeah. I love that idea of teaching your children to be proud as Catholics, never to hide our Catholicism, which can be tempting when you're in a culture that is aggressively anti-Catholic. Yes, and, and I think the best way to deal with that is to overcompensate. So we actually, we, we put our flag up on every solemnity and Sunday, uh, and, and everyone knows. Vatican flag? Oh, no, Norwegian flag. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I would like the Vatican, but yeah. we take it one step at a time. Yeah, well, you come to the right place to buy it. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> Hopefully I will get one. Uh, yeah. For, you were just mentioning the challenges uh, in culture today, and... What do you want for your children mm. as, as a Catholic, but as a, as a Catholic father? My wife says that our role as parent is to try to get their children to purgatory. Oh. And if we can manage to do that, uh, we probably will end in purgatory as well, and then finally in heaven. Uh, so, so I think what we need to do is to, to show them the beauty. We have to show them that we have to, as parents, we have to build a group of other kids that they can be together with so they can learn the faith, take them, of course, to Sunday Mass. And, and also, we, we spend a lot of time with our children telling them that our church, our parish church, that is our second home. And it was so nice when we came down here earlier today and, 
and they were pointing at the window where the Pope had the Angulus because mm -hmm. we followed the EWTN broadcast. Mm -hmm. And she pointed and she asked me if Pope Francis was there. <laughs> that she has to wait until Sunday. <laughs> yeah. You're a convert, you said. What was it that drew you to the Catholic faith? It was the beauty of the Mass. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember I, I, the first time I came to a Catholic church was on Ash Wednesday. And then there was this old deacon with the cross in his uh, forehead. And I was scared. And so I didn't know what to say. I was going to ask when it was mass and, or how the Catholic Church is, is working. And I just asked him if he knew where the post office was. <laughs> and then uh, the second time I managed to get back to the Catholic Church was on Good Friday. Uh, and when, they, when it was the kissing of the cross, I knew that this is the place where I'm supposed to be. Uh, of course, I had to learn all the other things, but it was a, it was a powerful thing, and I, I knew that this is my place. That's beautiful. And do you hope with your radio station now to help evangelize the rest of Norway with yes. the truth? Uh, that, that, that's basically the whole idea. Right. Uh, and now uh, when we also have the help of EWTN, we can also do more video. Yes. Uh, and hopefully we can reach more people and show them the beauty of, of the church. Yes. So uh, now we have been... Do, we did... Uh, for about 40 episodes from uh, Kiev in the beginning of the war. We had a diary from there, uh, a religious sister making uh, a, a daily program for us. And, and I think to show this, to show the beauty of the church in all the suffering, that's maybe the best thing we yeah. can do through the radio. Uh, absolutely, and I think you, through witnessing through your family as well, I think is a beautiful way to, to show the truth uh, as well. And so I just thank you so much for being here. Our prayers are with you as you continue on with the delegation at the World's Meeting of Families. And thank you so much for your work, Paul Johannes. Thank you. Thank you. And now, before the World's Meeting of Families kicks off tomorrow, we're going to take a look back at when it first all began. The world's meeting of families this week is the 10th one in 28 years. It was St. John Paul II who launched the first world's meeting of families in 1994, largely as a response to the modern attacks on the family. At that time, the United Nations General Assembly had dubbed 1994 as the International Year of the Family a year filled with events that promoted abortion and population control advocates. St. John Paul II understood the opportunity to correct and evangelize. The modern-day saint declared the end of 1993 a special year of the family for the church. In 1994, the Polish pontiff took a series of actions to highlight the beauty of the family. He issued a letter for families. He beatified the heroic doctor Gianna Beretta Mala, who gave her life in 1962 to ensure the safe birth of her daughter. John Paul II instructed the Pontifical Council for the Family, now a part of the dicastery for lady, family, and life. And that same year, the modern-day saint established what would be the inaugural World's Meeting of Families. The event took place in Rome. The 1994 World Meeting of Families was so successful, it has since become a regular event in the life of the church, taking place approximately once every three years. Out of the 10 World Meeting of Families so far, three were in Rome, including this year's. The other cities have included Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Manila, Philippines, Valencia, Spain, Mexico City, Mexico, Milan, Italy, Philadelphia, USA, and Dublin, Ireland. Now, 28 years since the first World Meeting of Families, St. John Paul II's vision has become all the more important. 
to your point earlier, Matthew, it really does seem JP2 was so prophetic in his vision here 28 uh, years later. And I have to say, in doing some research for that report, it was helpful to find an article by a certain Dr. Matthew Benson. <laughs> so thank you for that. And, and well, thank you for reminding me about <laughs> yes. the article. <laughs> yes, you are, you are a historian and theologian. It's helpful to hear more about the history of the world meeting. Take us back to 1994 and all that was going well, on. A lot of things were happening in 1994 that John Paul II was very worried about. Uh, one of the most pressing was that the UN decided uh, to declare a year of the family. That, frankly, looking back on it, was uh, a way of anticipating so many of the things that we've seen since, but it, it yeah. made a real mockery of real, any understanding of the traditional family. And John Paul II had been watching these trends building for years. Mm. We had already seen in his pontificate efforts to really steer the church toward a, a more faithful interpretation of the council, mm. his warnings about the threats to the human person. Now mm. he was concerned about the threats to the family. And so he created the year of the family. Mm. And then that led to the first world meeting of families, right. which uh, building, again, on some of the things that he was trying to accomplish at the World Youth Days, bringing people together from all over the world mm -hmm. to have that shared experience and then sending them back out again under the title of the family, the heart of the civilization of love. Wow. So we think of the culture of life and the culture of death. One of the phrases that John Paul also loved was building that civilization of love. That's beautiful. Yes, he took a series of actions that year in 1994 as a response. As you mentioned, the World Meeting of Families, he created, issued a letter to families. He created the Pontifical Council for the Family and also, as we mentioned, beatified Dr. Gianna Beretta Mala, <laughs> right. who's a powerful witness today. One of the things he wanted that first World Meeting of Families to focus on, he, he when he spoke to the families, he used a Latin phrase, mm -hmm. familia, uh, Quid dicis ante ipsa? What family? What do you say for yourself? Mm -hmm. How do you identify? What do you call yourself? Mm -hmm. And he then went on to extemporaneously speak for about thirty minutes, uh, without notes, on what he understood family to be. And for him, uh, the reality of the family has to be grounded in the reality of who God is mm -hmm. and how God created us. And as we've been talking about this whole hour, one of the challenges of, of society now is just the denial of all sorts of yes. facts about reality. And truths. And it seems by proposing that question that I won't be able to repeat in Latin, but it seems as if it was this almost self-examination for every family. You know, what do you, what do you say for yourself? Yes. And I, I think part of the hope of the World Meeting of Families is all families, yes, it's limited to 2,000 family members this year in particular, but all families across the globe should be doing that same self-examination. But coming out of that self-examination, then asking other families, yes. who are you? What do you say for yourself? Yes. And that's a question I think that every family needs to ask and every family needs to be asked. Yes. A lot of people have asked me in preparation for the World Meeting of Families, you know, how can we participate? You know, what are ways? You know, supposedly there are certain dioceses who should be organizing different events. So I encourage everyone, look at the local diocese, see if there are activities happening there. But also I think by watching and, and listening in and also taking that to prayer to your own family. And hopefully all the families who are watching can bring this back to their home too. Isn't that the ultimate goal? Well, this seems to be a theme even of our guest today, right? right? That the way to help grow in holiness in family is to pray together and to yeah. make God a reality. I appreciated Paul Johannes's uh, comment that they're, he's just trying to make sure his kids get to purgatory, <laughs> you know? Uh, I personally believe most of us end up in purgatory mm -hmm. if we're doing well, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully we mm -hmm. don't end up in hell, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, bypassing purgatory is a, is a, is a great endeavor, but you know, for most of us, that's probably where, and we're going to end up in right. what a better destination. Right. <laughs> At a time when so many in culture, they just don't deny the existence of purgatory. They deny outright the possible existence of hell to have that concern for your children. Yeah. That Absolutely. that has to be their ultimate destination. Absolutely. And you want to do as a parent everything you can to make that happen. It's, it's, it was a profound statement, almost a throwaway statement, but a very profound yes. statement. And, and the sacraments are integral to this. You know, I can't help but think it was just this past Sunday, Corpus Christi. And I imagine the Eucharist and sacraments will come up as well throughout the speeches. I would hope so. You know, St. John Paul II, you know, to build on that point, Matthew, once when he spoke about the legacy of parents, so often in the culture we hear about, you know, leaving your mark on the world, right. what, what will people remember about you when you die. He said for parents, that's really secondary. Mm -hmm. The most important legacy parents can leave is for their children to end up in the beatific vision, to be with God, because that's an eternal legacy. Mm -hmm.
And, e and even though it is simple and even though it is hidden, it is the most important. And it is so great that the church is focusing on the family and that we'll be focusing on the family as well. And with that, that concludes our preview show of the world's meeting of families here in St. Peter's Square. But our coverage continues all week. If you've missed any part of the program, you can go to EWTN's YouTube page and catch it there. Go to EWTN's Facebook page to see different live streams and make sure to tune in tomorrow where we'll be covering the Festival of Families, the official kickoff event for the world meeting of families. We'll see you then tomorrow. Lord Jesus Christ, shepherd of souls, who called the apostles to be fishers of men, raise up new apostles in your holy church. Teach them that to serve you is to reign, to possess you is to possess all things. Kindle in the hearts of our people the fire of zeal for souls. Make them eager to spread your kingdom upon earth. Grant them courage to follow you who are the way, the truth, and the life, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, to thy most sacred heart I confide this intention. Only look upon me, then do what thy heart inspires. Let thy sacred heart decide. I count on thee, I trust in thee, I throw myself on thy mercy, Lord Jesus. Thou wilt not fail me, sacred heart of Jesus, I trust in thee. Sacred heart of Jesus, I believe in thy love for me. Sacred heart of Jesus, thy kingdom come. O sacred heart of Jesus, I have asked thee for many favors, but I earnestly implore this one. Take it, place it in thine open, broken heart, and when the Eternal Father looks upon it, covered with thy precious blood, he will not refuse it. It will no longer be my prayer, but thine, O Jesus. O sacred heart of Jesus, I place all my trust in thee. Let me never be confounded. Amen. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we sigh, mourning and weeping in this veil of tears. Turn then, most gracious Advocate, thine eyes of mercy toward us. And after this our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Amen. EWTN. Live Truth. Live Catholic.